Hello, I'm Sid Davis. I'm the Director of Music and Fine Arts at St. Luke's United Methodist Church. And this is our third episode of Methodantics, Investigating Dusty Ideas, where we're just trying to answer some questions you might have about parts of worship or things you see in worship, physical objects that are in worship, and about what you may have wondered all your life. Why do we do that? Or where did that come from? Or what does that mean? And you may think you're the only person who doesn't know the answer. That is, I can guarantee you not the truth. And we're going to try to uh, answer some of those questions for you. Um, if you've missed our first two episodes, you can follow us on social media and uh, keep up with um, our questions and submit questions so that we will be answering the questions that you need to have answered. Uh, I'm with my friend Justin Baer, who's going to introduce himself in today's question. As Sid said, my name is Justin Baer. I'm the Associate Director of Worship and Music at St. Luke's. And as I introduce myself and the more of these conversations we have, I ask myself, like, why am I the Director of Worship and Music uh, <clears throat> at St. Luke's? Because I have a tremendous amount to learn. And as Sid said, it can be a really kind of a lonely feeling to feel like maybe you're the only one who has these questions and that you're you supposed to know these things, especially if you've been not just at St. Luke's, but at any Methodist church for any amount of time. Um, if there are sort of these big fancy church words that you, you've you heard a lot, but maybe you don't know why they're called that thing or what purpose they serve. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like when you meet somebody and they introduce themselves and then you forget their name immediately, which happens constantly. Uh, and then like you're casual with them for way too long and it's just it's past the point where you can't ask them what their name is it's and you know you don't want to you don't want to feel embarrassed by having been maybe even a, a really intrinsic part of or integral part of of serving the community of st luke's and maybe there are questions that you have and you're like i should know the answer to this and i don't want to ask anybody um i have none of those uh, inhibitions and so I ask Sid constantly what are these things that I'm supposed to, to know and these words and so it just tells me and so that's a lot of what today is when we're going to be talking about pyramids and if you don't know what that word is as I also did not um, pyramids are essentially the dressings that you would see on um, any one of the altar the the lectern the pulpit um, and what the ministers themselves wear. That's right. And this is not only a concept about which people don't really know much, uh, which there's nothing wrong with that. I was in, once in that place, uh, but the actual pieces themselves. For example, the ministers wear, we all wear black robes. I'm not an ordained clergy. I'm a lay person, just like most of the people who are listening to this. And I don't wear a stole because I'm not ordained. Those stoles are reserved for people who are ordained, ordained elders or deacons, which in the United Methodist Church, we refer to that as the diaconate, or they are diaconal ministers, which uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But those stoles those would be referred to as pyramids, or as Justin and I were talking about earlier, vestments or vestiture. There, that's an overlap. Justin taught me a word today. Um, those stoles uh, change with the see the colors change with the seasons. We'll get to the seasons and the, what those colors mean in a different episode. But the 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 one on the pulpit is called a scarf. The the little hanging in the front of the pulpit is called a scarf. The one on the on the altar is called a frontal. It goes all the way across, it, over the top and down in front of the altar called the frontal. And then the, the one on the lectern is actually called a bookmark because if you look at it, it's two long strips and you can see that they're sort of the shape of bookmarks. We actually don't use them that way. And I, I don't think there are probably many churches who do just because that's not very convenient and they're very thick, handmade, hand uh, needle pointed, but that's, that's what those three things are. The scarf, the frontal, the bookmark, and then the stoles for the ministers. And the bookmark idea is that, you know, I would, I would just look at the lectern and see these things hanging off and not think anything of it and not think that, that it served a purpose besides like just an embellishment. 
because it feels like an embellishment, which is, you know, you, we make our sanctuary beautiful with these things and we, we represent the seasons with these things, but to have it as an actual functionality and, you know, I, I just sort of picture however long ago that somebody was actually just, they had this massive pretty ribbon bookmark and would flip it open and have this huge <laughs> Bible in front of them, probably KJV and uh, read from the, from the Bible and then flip this huge bookmark back over. And that's probably, probably, right. probably happened a lot or maybe still happens, but I would not have, you know, that's, that's not a surface level thing you can just put together. That's, you know, you have to know those things, which is why I love talking about this stuff. Um, I've always been fascinated since I was a little kid with the part of the Bible where it talks about building the tabernacle in the wilderness and the specifics from God about how that should be done. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses because once in a while people will say, why do we spend so much money on this or time or why do we take such great care of these things? And I always think about these verses. Make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with cherubim woven into them by a skilled worker. All the curtains are to be the same size, 28 cubits long and four cubits wide. Join five of the curtains together, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just so specific about the quality of that. And, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I'm definitely a different generation. And when it comes time to get ready to go to church and getting dressed, I think we set ourselves apart by dressing up to go to church. It's like, this is, this is something unique and special and for which it deserves our best. And the chancel is certainly the same way, if not more so, it deserves our best. So we have, yes, fairly lavish things up there because we set that apart to, yeah. to yeah. be, so it is obviously something special. Yeah, that's the thing that, like in, in the, the readings you were talking about, like it reminded me of a uh, verse in Second Samuel where um, a field was going to be given to King David to build the temple on. And he refused to just accept it as a gift because he said, I cannot offer the Lord a sacrifice that cost me nothing. Mm -hmm. And so there's like examples like that and examples like what you read. That's, that's sort of an instruction that we received where we say, these are the things of value. And because they have value, um, it makes them, it, it sets them apart. And so what we do is we take things that are of value. And if, if it's not just the yarn itself, it's the time that it takes to do these things, like the value of the human labor that it took to create this thing. And placing that value on it is what makes it set apart. It's what makes it special. So the definition of holiness is something that is set apart or, or set apart for a purpose. Um, we could, as, as we all do now when we scan Amazon and like, oh, this thing's $16.98, this one's $16.50. I'm gonna go with that one because I'm really gonna be missing 48. That's right, and, and it's free shipping. shipping. <laughs> and free shipping. So how do you, 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 can't, you can't contrive holiness out of a thing that's gonna end up on your doorstep in two days or less that you just plucked on your phone. Um, it's, it becomes just a sort of a filler, it becomes utility and there's no other significance to that thing. It reminds me of a, a comedian <laughs> that I used to listen to religiously, as it were. Uh, he said, I bought a $5 pen because I got sick of losing pens and not caring. Because he <laughs> just, if it doesn't have any value to you, you don't care what happens to it. Like these, right. the, like the, the kneelers that you see are, are they're from the seventies, I think. That's right. Um, and all of all the pyramids, everything that we see is something that was done by a human being by hand. Uh, I know um, power, I know, by our people. Yeah, yeah. I know um, Christy Parsons is a, a head usher that I've gotten to know really well, and she's talked to me many times about the hours that she spent making Tom's stole and um, the hours that it takes just to make one square inch of this thing, and that that's what we can that's what we can offer as value to, to make this sacred space that's right i had said to justin just earlier to go to a church i know i know that 
often we think of European churches this way because they're so much older than we are. There are some in the United States this way where you kneel on a kneeler that was made a hundred years ago or hundreds of years ago. People that are no, they're now part of the great cloud of witnesses and that goes on. Um, there's part of the communion liturgy at Winchester Cathedral in England that says you are entering a conversation that began long before you were born and will continue long after you're dead. And those stoles, when you see them on the ministers or anything up there, were made by our people every stitch. Some of those people no longer with us. And that green stole may not be your favorite shade of green, but every single stitch was done with love by somebody that was a St. Luke's person. I think that's tremendous uh, depth to think about in history, you know, gives us a, a real scope. This conversation has been going on and, and will continue long after. Mm -hmm. Once you feel this small, and while that's kind of unnerving and it's, it's humbling, you realize that you can't, you can't fathom the greatness of these things and the infinitude of these things without starting this small. You have to start this small to appreciate that. I think all, you know, cathedrals in, in Europe do that so well when you walk in and it's just the inside goes to the heavens and you go, well, I'm this big and um, I mean nothing. So all of that must mean much more than I do. It helps you understand the vastness of God. Um, the colors, we're going to talk about those when we talk about seasons, but just so we can just get that out on the table, the, the colors of the pyramids are blue, uh, white, green, red, and then there is a set that's also black that you only see on one day of the church year, but there's a whole black set and they are, they're stunning for a whole different reason. I mean, they're really, really beautiful and sobering, but all of those colors mean something and we'll get to that when we talk about seasons. You won't, you won't catch it if you weren't already looking for it, I don't think, but um, we are, we're actually in a passage of seasons right now and we're switching uh, pyramid colors. We're, we're at green now and we've been at, at, in red all summer um, and we'll talk about why that is. That's right. So we end our sessions with uh, a question that might help you know us better. And so we'll feel like maybe we're in each other's living, room, living rooms just having these discussions. And our question today is, is there anything that, so we all, we all knew going into this time of COVID, what some of the challenges were gonna be, I think along the way, and like we knew really early on we were going to be missing our friends and, and just the social aspect of how fulfilling it is to just be in the presence of another human. And we have these, you know, this facade and this virtual person, as it were, uh, but we don't get that present. And so we, there were things that we knew were going to be less than ideal. Uh, but then there are things that I think have come up where we're like, that is also less than ideal, but I did not anticipate that. Um, probably some of you are thinking the number of times that somebody has begun talking to you through your computer and you can't hear them. Very annoying. One that's, that's really particular for us, I have a, I'm in a family of four. So it's my wife and our two daughters, a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And the occasional family dinner in the car like if you're on a road trip or something it's fine you make it work but the number of dinners family dinners we've had in the car like i'm sitting at the at the steering wheel and i'm trying to eat a salad like this and the girls are crying in the back and my wife is trying to eat her dinner and also turn around and feed ivy my one-year-old these tiny little morsels so that she doesn't choke in her car seat and nora has just spilled her drink all over herself and then we just know that it's going to be a whole thing when we get home, um, I am not going to miss family of four meals in the car. Uh, I'm going to be really glad to go into a restaurant and make a mess and tip really well <laughs> for somebody else to clean that up for me. 
I guess I didn't real, I mean, there was no reason for me to really realize it in this, to this extent. I've really missed making music because my instrument is people. And uh, yes, I play the piano and I could do that sort of music making at home. I haven't done that a lot, but I've done almost no music making at all until last Tuesday when we started our new sort of virtual rehearsal format. And uh, I was frankly a little worried about, can I, will I remember how to do this? Will I remember how to ride this bike? Um, but since the instrument I play is people, I've just mostly been doing music administration, you know, and leaning on the people, the Justins and Graces and Jims and Robs and Randy's and Monica's that have uh, made the real, the trains run on time. So I very much look forward to being back so that that can happen again. And it will. It and will. will be stronger. It will indeed. I think, you know, undoubtedly there will be things that will be different. There's, um, which isn't a bad thing. Things will be different. But I think um, just how much we need other people is something that will never change. And I think whenever, whenever it's time, people are just going to be clawing to get back to other people. Uh, I am I'm a staunch introvert. <laughs> I am starving for people. So I know I'm there too. Well, this is always fun. I'm so glad we do this. Yes, me too. Thanks for joining us today. And we hope you'll join us next week when we'll have a different topic. If you are, just I'm going to let you do the email thing because I always do it wrong. Uh, so my, you can email me questions or you can email Sid. My email is jbear at stluxmethodist.org or Sid Davis, S Davis at stluxmethodist.org. Also. That's right. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Okay. See you later. Bye.